Hello. Um, uh, me and Raina are presenting uh, this uh, work uh, on behalf of uh, uh, the six collaborators, the five collaborators that were involved in this work, uh, Dorina, uh, Stella Stileu, Suvi, uh, and ourselves. Um, and I want to start with a project I, that I was personally involved at some stage. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Mesada in Israel, which is um, a fortress from uh, the, the time of Herod. It's uh, located in the Judean desert in Israel. It's uh, 400 meters high. There are cliffs going down on the side of the Dead Sea. On the other side, towards the city of Arad, it's 90 meters, so it's more accessible. Uh, but it's a, a very interesting site. It's challenging because of the location and its isol isolation. It's a plateau on top of this um, uh, cliff complex, and uh, it has an, a very beautiful and interesting palace from uh, the time of Herod. Uh, uh, interesting legend is attached to this uh, archaeological site, which is very important uh, for the Jewish people. It talks about the Jewish rebels at the time of Herod. They had a revolution in Jerusalem, and then they were hunted uh, down, and they closed themselves into this castle. They were besieged by the Romans, and eventually the story doesn't end, go end good for the Jewish rebels, because the, the Romans built a, a ramp and managed to go inside the site. Uh, but coming back to archaeological uh, knowledge production, this site wa was lost for several decades when it was rediscovered in the first quarter of the 20th century. And then it was uh, extensively excavated and documented in 1963. Uh, by the team of Yigal uh, Yadin, who, who was involved in many excavations uh, of important sites in Israel. Uh, they were seven months on the top of his team in the ex ex uh, expedition. They were seven months uh, excavating and documenting the site uh, under very, very difficult uh, conditions. And the outcome of this uh, expedition uh, was uh, five volumes of books on Metzada, which, which show the do documentation of all aspects and the history. Uh, Mesada number three uh, describes and documents the architectural aspects of the site. Uh, architect Hud Netzer uh, was involved in the writing and the documentation of this book. And what you see here on my screen is uh, a couple of scans of the architectural and topographical drawings that are inside the book, folded neatly in this uh, very thick uh, volume. Um, several years later, um, in 2013, uh, myself with the collaboration of, of two other universities in Italy, University of Florence and University of Pavia, we created uh, for our students uh, an international workshop on uh, documentation of uh, archaeological sites. And within 15 days, uh, 15 days, uh, like that was the time that we spent on the site. We documented the whole plateau with all the structures. Um, we used uh, laser scanning. Uh, we used photogrammetry uh, through uh, air photogrammetry with drones. We used ground photogrammetry. And eventually, we combined all the data acquired, all the dif different sets of data that came out uh, from the different methodologies that we use into one comprehensive file. 
Um, what you see here is a very detailed floor plan, which is the top view of the point cloud uh, that came uh, from this um, international workshop. We were able to extract sections, accurate sections of the whole site. Uh, in different locations of the site, we were able to create the sections while in uh, in the initial Masada book, there was one section, and, and there some of the heights were very accurate, but the in-between heights didn't have a, a high accuracy. Um, and uh, what you see here is uh, approximately 100 scan stations, plus all the photogrammetic data which was uh, integrated into the same file. We were able to create uh, detailed uh, drawings for several of the areas. And we were even able to get some 3D models going, which through the reverse en engineering, as you see um, on the lower uh, corner, we were able to print them uh, and have actual parts of the walls uh, of Metzada. So what has changed between the time that Yigal Yadin was there with uh, his team and we were there with a bunch of students? And uh, what has changed is mainly that the way we do archaeological survey. We used to do uh, archaeological survey with uh, um, a tape measure and with sketching very accurately and with using some sticks for scale. And today we have several more tools in our uh, availability. We have laser scanning, which uh, Maurice showed uh, quite amazing projects uh, that they did. Um, we have LADAR, which uh, today not only can the LADAR uh, methodology give us uh, the documentation of quite large areas, but it can even uh, scan through foliage and through trees to give us uh, a comprehensive idea of what's happening on the ground. And we have the photogrammetry techniques that can be taken uh, from the ground or can be taken from the air. And then all these ways of uh, data acquisitions, they give us different kind of data sets that need to be post-processed in the office and they can give us very accurate uh, drawings, point clouds, and we can have all the information and then we can go back to this data set if we are missing information about a certain area and find all the detailed information there. Uh, there are pros and cons, whether using photogrammetry or whether using laser scanning, some of the equipment is more expensive. Uh, some of the, uh, the equipment like photogrammetry can be done with a simple camera, but we can also use a drone. So there are different uh, varieties of price ranges for the equipment uh, and also the speed of each uh, equipment is different. So we have a, a large choice depending on our budget and on our time. But for sure, it saves us time on the site. On the other hand, what has happened is the field of archaeology needs uh, more fields of expertise. We need uh, experts, uh, expert technicians to run the different equipment. We need specialists that deal with data management because we create huge amount of data while we are only two weeks on the site, we have uh, gigabytes and gigabytes of data sets, uh, data sets that have uh, different file formats and somebody needs to know how to manipulate them. 3D modelers that can manipulate the 3D point clouds, the photogrammetry model that can combine them and get one integrated uh, s uh, data set and uh, of course we need an IT infrastructure and all these fields are not taught today in university in the field of archaeology. So the archaeologist comes and uh, finds himself being dependent 
on other kind of experts to do his work and to do the documentation. I will uh, I will continue now uh, in the same direction as Rebecca, probably a little less coherent because I have um, presentations from several other people. Uh, we are just trying to put you video. Okay, after this uh, impressive example uh, of uh, Masada, we will give you another very positive example of the use of uh, photogrammetric techniques for the uh, archaeological documentation. It is the work done uh, by Dorina and uh, her colleagues uh, in the early days of uh, such uh, photogrammetric uh, projects in uh, archaeology. Uh, and. Uh, this uh, here is uh, especially the emphasis of the project of uh, recording the circuit wall. Uh, from 19th century, uh, there was a great number of studies concerning the standing monuments uh, that are on the top of the hill, like the Parthenon, the Erechteion, uh, the Propylaea, uh, which is the uh, monumental uh, entrance. Sorry, I don't know what's happening to the video. And uh, the biggest issue uh, the biggest issue was uh, in documenting uh, of the walls is that were not uh, easily accessible as uh, you can see uh, in, the, uh, in this video. So there was no systematic recording of the construction phases, uh, the ancient uh, architectural members, the fragments of sculpture, and the, the inscriptions that has been incorporated into them. Uh, not to mention any studies for its stability and its seismic uh, behavior, which will uh, turn out to be uh, very important. So although the need for this uh, research uh, was uh, recognized, practically from the beginning uh, of the uh, restoration works uh, uh, that started in 1975, nothing had been uh, done. And well, as I already said, the reason is very simple. As you can see in this uh, video, the walls are practically inaccessible. The hill is so steep and the walls so, si so high up that one cannot have physical access in order uh, to uh, document. So uh, until the advent of digital photogrammetry uh, and laser scan and uh, the use of uh, balloon, uh, it was simply uh, not uh, possible. So uh, this uh, is one very uh, positive example. Uh, here you can see a plan view ortho uh, photo mosaic. Uh, you can see here uh, ortho mosaic uh, of the wall, and down you can see part uh, of the south wall. Uh, here is the textured uh, 3D model uh, for the walls. And uh, this project was not only uh, documenting uh, uh, ar archaeological and architectural remains, but also uh, it uh, showed uh, the possibilities for future and new uh, interpretations. Uh, one of uh, the uh, example is the in investigation of a structural failure of the uh, part of the uh, north wall. Uh, this failure includes the collapse of structural members, extended damages in the outer facade of the monument and uh, rotation with seven centimeter displacement in the current wall crown. In the historic data, uh, like data from uh, antiquity until the 1700s, uh, uh, you can see that the area is practically uh, intact. 
By 1890, it appears that the area uh, particularly, uh, partially collapsed and was uh, rebuilt. So uh, using the data from the geometric documentation, uh, they performed, uh, Dorina and her colleagues uh, performed uh, staged back uh, analysis. And what results showed is something that is really appropriate um, to present here at this conference that actually the uh, ground shifted uh, sometimes uh, during an uh, earthquake uh, which caused uh, the uh, failure. And uh, after searching the seismic loading history, they came up with the conclusion that the uh, earthquake that caused the damage uh, occurred between 1785 uh, or the uh, 80, uh, zero, 1805 uh, earthquake. So this is one very positive example of the use of uh, digital documentation for documentation preservation and even new interpretation uh, and align uh, with the uh, historical record. But uh, as we all know from the problems uh, that we are facing on everyday level and from the presentations uh, from today uh, and yesterday, there are uh, various issues uh, connected with the uh, digital documentation and use of various technological uh, solutions uh, in the uh, archaeological record. Uh, we heard already several times some of the shortcomings that we detect uh, in using digital documentation. One of them is shorter time uh, spent uh, with actual archaeological feature, which is especially the case uh, with prehistoric sites that are basically only holes in the ground that you excavate and destroy and you cannot go uh, back to uh, see them. And of course, uh, storage and uh, archiving and the requirements uh, by uh, the equipment. Uh, some of our co-authors on this paper, uh, particularly Suvi, have uh, already uh, various uh, solution for uh, some of these uh, shortcomings. Um, for example, uh, in the different documentation system, there is one little example how problems can arise uh, such as this little detail like the color documentation. And it's small in comparison to, pr to problems with new file mo formats, the portability of the data, the accessibility of the data, and the uh, availability within the uh, different system. Uh, another problem that we are all facing are, of course, uh, the file formats, which add new data silos of isolated information with new islands popping into existence constantly. This leads to a further disintegration of data into pictures, laser scans, written documentations, drawings, and uh, as you all know, we can go on like this uh, practically forever. So uh, what uh, her company, the Inari Software, is um, trying to do and are doing is uh, perceiving the excavation as an information system. So within that information system, we can deconstruct the process into small parts and uh, analyze. And to handle the growing amounts of the data, we can harness the power of software developed for information systems that can link the data for us and prevent data silos, allowing, uh, allowing us to find unexpected connections. Uh, this is something that has been done uh, by other producers or of uh, large uh, data in uh, other disciplines as well. And more and more it started to be produced in uh, archaeology as well. Uh, this is an example of the uh, Inari uh, system for uh, archaeological uh, documentation. So the big advantage of such information system is that all information are connected in one place, that it's easy to search and provide basic s statistics, that uh, output of documentation is easy, and of course the possibility uh, 
for interfaces uh, to other system. So part of the problems that are uh, facing by uh, or acknowledged by archaeologists in terms of use this digital, digital documentation are already being uh, overcome by uh, systems like that. Some other stuff that archaeologists pinpoint as the real risks of using the digital documentation is that we start to focus too much on economic value rather than the scientific value of the um, advantages of digital documentation. We can make it faster, we can make it more precise, it looks much better, it attracts people, maybe even funding it more easily, but uh, that we do not use it enough for the real scientific improvement of uh, archaeology. Then we have this problem of post-production because uh, unlike before where, in, where you had to document your, uh, your situations immediately, now you can make series of pictures, make a 3D model and possibly never draw it or never uh, put appropriate markings uh, on the uh, st stratigraphy. Uh, and also there is the question of, okay, uh, there is the question of, um, well, the uh, reliability of the person who is doing the documentation because uh, sometimes the person who uh, is doing the work, the technological work, usually ends up for, uh, by his or her misfortune in interpreting something that uh, they were not uh, meant uh, to do. These are examples, I don't have mo mo more time about uh, from the research uh, th that we did in Croatia on uh, archeologists and their opinions on digital archeology span and what they all said, as you can see here, is that nobody taught us how to use these data in archeological sense. Uh, and that the biggest flaw is the perception that technology can solve archeological problems instead of archeologists. But it's not the problem with archeology. span it's the problem with us. It's the problem with the human factor as uh, usually. So what we really need, I think that we are uh, past the point of no return in should we do this or not. Uh, yes, we should, but we will also need new protocols and procedure for archeological documentation, for archeological excavation that will incorporate all these issues that all of us uh, are talking about. But on the other hand, uh, I think that, and we think that this is the first time in the history of archaeology that there is a significant shift uh, in the discipline, that it is, can be changed on epistemological and, as Paul said, also ontological level, because for the first time we can make recordings of all of our process and all of our mistakes, and we can make an autopsy of the work that we have done. And uh, well, to conclude, we think that it will really change the discipline uh, in a sense that David Clark predicted in, in the 1970s. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raina and Rebecca. Um, that was a great talk. And it was fascinating to see the advantages and disadvantages balanced in, in that way of this new technology. And uh, can I um, invite you in the audience to, to, uh, to put questions to, to the two speakers? Uh, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask about the um, the wall, that, the wall that was um, shifted due to the earthquake. Um, I thought that that was quite an interesting application of postgrammetry, where you have a you get almost temporal uh, information from it. Um, uh, so the the information from the wall before it kind of shifted was that um, made due to photogrammetry, or was it from old drawings? Uh, okay, please, uh, Dorina will answer that question because it's oh. her research. <laughs> so um, the the original data, like the the wall before being shifted, 
um, if, if you can, um, if you can please, okay, now in, in camera, anyway. So if you can, yeah, yeah. Uh, before that, uh, before, before, there. So you can see that there are uh, four sections over there. So um, part of the wall is shifted, part of the wall is collapsed, and another part of the wall seems to be intact because there is no shifting. So we use as uh, our um, original data, the original geometry, uh, we use the, the part of the wall, the part of the section that was intact. Then um, uh, we wanted to, uh, to use the back analysis in order to find uh, what event, what kind of event could cause uh, this pathology to the monument. And um, so we wanted to go to, 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 we wanted to have a result of the shifted one. So, and when we had that, we realized that that was due to an earthquake uh, of, uh, and that earthquake had certain properties. So the certain properties, um, according to the loading, the seismic uh, history, so that was, uh, there were only two uh, earthquakes that actually uh, fit, uh, our, um, uh, fit our timeline and um, the, the magnitude and the properties of the uh, event. So. There's one question at the back. I wanted to ask Rebecca, uh, between the older surveying and then the, the whole survey scan, et cetera, that you did, uh, did you notice any deterioration in any areas, uh, erosion or collapses? Uh, the old survey, uh, the drawings that were produced were in scale uh, 1 to 500. So even if there were uh, minor displacements or um, any other kind of movement, in such a scale it's not possible uh, to, to recognize it. We we did do some superpositions between our plans and uh, the existing plans, and there were some changes, but we are not so sure if the changes are because of the change of scale. Our data set has no scale, um, so it, it can be presented in any scale that we zoom into, while when we have physical drawings that we scan also, uh, we don't know if the inaccuracies and the parts that do not match have to do with the scale of, of the drawing being such a, a faraway scale rather than with displacement that happened over the years. Uh, with the original work, um, did they do a lot of uh, photo documentation at the time? Not a, not a lot in my opinion. There, there are in the publications close-up pictures of elements and some pictures of the people working in the sites, uh, but not uh, zoom out or uh, we don't have any aerial footage from the time. We have aerial footage from later on. Okay, that's a pity. <laughs> <laughs>